Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me today? Yes. Thank you. So <clears throat> Wednesday, November 11th. Wednesday, November 11th. We have two more chapters to cover in this class. Almost there, a couple of weeks before the Thanksgiving break. What I want to start with, before we start chapter 11, I want to briefly go over a very interesting paper that I, that was in the most recent um, issue of um, the Journal of American Chemical Society. So let me share the screen. Let me share the screen. It's right here. So, um, you know, the American Chemical Society is the organization of chemists in this country, right? Um, and it, it publishes a lot of uh, good journals as well. And so the Journal of the American Chemical Society is um, one of, basically the top journal in chemistry and publishes some really good papers. So um, after Nature and Science, uh, JAX, it's sometimes referred to as JAX, JAX is probably the next most um, prestigious journal to publish papers in. And so this paper, I actually uploaded this to um, Canvas, so you can look at that, uh, basically deals with uh, sphingolipid, sphingolipid, in particular sphingosine. Remember sphingosine, so there is a structure that it should be familiar to you, SPH, that's sphingosine, Right, so remember this is a um, the backbone of sphingolipids, right? Two hydroxyls, one amino group, and double bond and a hydrocarbon chain. And so, uh, so what this paper deals with is let's briefly look at the abstract. So it's a single chain sphingolipid, sphingosine. So we know it's an essential structural lipid, and also signaling molecule. So we will actually talk about signaling. Uh, in this chapter primarily, but we talked about its uh, function as a structural lipid in chapter 10 already. And so uh, it turns out, so we talked about metabolism of these lipids and how many different diseases are associated with incorrect metabolism, right? So if particular enzymes are absent or there are defects, uh, they're mutated then the defects in, in lipid metabolism can lead to a lot of diseases. And you can see here, cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer. Uh, so, but the interesting thing is that uh, even though sphingosine is such an important lipid, we still do not have very good tools for detecting its levels in living cells, right? So in other words, if, you, if not, uh, think about it, if, sphing if there's too much sphingosine, right? If it's not <coughs> uh, degraded, um, uh, then uh, we don't really know, we don't really have tools to actually, to find out how much of it is in there, right? And, and also we can obviously not make any prognosis in terms of the disease outcome, for example, right? In particular patient Whose, dis whose disorder is associated with accumulation of sphingosine in living cells. All right, so, uh, and in general, uh, there, is, uh, there is a big need for developing highly selective and live cell compatible affinity probe for hydrophobic lipid species. Why do you think, so, so when we talk about affinity probe, what that means is that something, there's a probe, small molecule, let's say it's a fluorescent molecule, and it binds to other molecules in a cell. And when it binds to something, it, its fluorescence goes up or its fluorescence goes down. And that's how the, uh, we determine the um, presence or absence of a particular molecule in a cell. So why do you think with lipids, it's hard to come up with probes compared with other molecules? 
So, uh, so there are probes for sugars, right? But um, why do you think there are so many probes for sugars, but not too many good probes for lipids? Because they're nonpolar. They're nonpolar, and what does that? What challenge does it present? They're relatively uncharged, so they won't bind to anything. Yeah, good. And also, they don't really have too many different functionality, which distinguishes them from other molecules. Just if you think about hydrocarbon chain, right? Hydrocarbon chains are, and they look very similar. So how do you tell apart between different lipids? So for example, if you have different carbohydrates, right? Glucose, galactose, you can easily uh, differentiate between them because stereochemistry is different. Hydroxyl groups are in different, in different orientation. Whereas with lipids, uh, you know, they all hydrocarbon chains. So it's um, very hard to tell one hydrocarbon chain from another. Uh, so your, uh, the head group is the only really um, possibility. And that's actually what this paper is based on. All right. So in this work, we developed a small molecule fluorescent turn on probe for labeling sphingosine and living cells. Now, so, um, so there is a disease uh, known as Neiman pick type C1. Uh, which is characterized by sphingosine accumulation in cells in these patients. And it's a lipid transport disorder in which increased sphingosine mediates disease progression. And so, uh, so basically they're showing that their probe, fluorescent probe, can be used with patients afflicted with this disease. All right, so what I highlighted in yellow, some of the um, things which uh, we can just briefly look at so sphingo lipids so we already know that uh, you can see everything we're learning in this class is relevant you can see it's all present in primary literature right several sphingo lipid species such as ceramids we know ceramids sphingomyelin we know sphingomyelin glucosyl ceramid we know that sphingos even know that the only thing we probably have not had on the slide yet is fingers in one phosphate but we can draw it already, right? Position one, put the phosphate on sphingosine. Anyway, so all these are integral signaling molecules in cell proliferation, apoptosis, we talked about apoptosis, migration, we talked about cancer metastasis, that's why these things are important. In cancer, for example, right? So if they, for example, if they suppress apoptosis, the cancer cell will not die. If they, if they promote migration, the cancer cell will undergo metastasis and migrate to distant sites in the body and, and start a new growth somewhere, right? So um, inflammation, intracellular trafficking. So what that means is that different um, components within the cell move to different positions in the cell. Anyway, so central role in cellular function. So obviously disruption of sphingolipid metabolism can have devastating biological effects. And you can see all these diseases and na na na. And so, um, and so there is tremendous interest in detecting and quantifying sphingolipids and biological samples. All right, so what, what these people came up with, so first of all, where these people came uh, are from. So Neil Devaraj, Neil Devaraj. So whenever you look at the list of authors, right, you always look at the author with the, uh, the first author is primarily, it's, it's gonna be either a student or postdoctoral researcher who's done most of the work, right? And the, usually the last author with a star, asterisk like this. So that will be the corresponding author. That means that's the professor in whose lab the work was done. So Neil Devaraj and um, now Jack put, started putting the affiliations at the end. So this guy, Department of Chemistry, Biochemistry, University of California, San Diego, so UCSD. So he's at UCSD. All right. So, uh, so here's their probe, right? So this is the idea, uh, proposed mechanism for the reaction between the, now this is uh, salicyl aldehyde containing probe one. So um, the idea is the following. So you have a, um, the salicylic aldehyde. Uh, salicylic basically means that it's a benzaldehyde that um, 
has an oxygen at the ortho position. So uh, Q is a part is a substituent on the benzene ring, which is a quencher. Mm -hmm. F is the substituent on the benzene benzene ring that is fluorescent. Okay, and so here they are. So this is the fluorescent. Now it's a fluorescent dye known as BDP. BDP. Um, if you read the article, you will hear you will see it spelled in many places. Um, Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Right there, Bodipi, okay. It's a very common fluorescent dye. Now there is, uh, and this uh, part of the molecule, that's the quencher, okay. It's based on this azo, azo linkages. And so basically what happens if you excite this with light, before it can emit light, fluorescent light, it undergoes quenching. And it goes quenching and it basically stays dark. So FEF fluorescent, Q quencher. And so, so sphingosine, like that, so this has a hydrocarbon chain, but what these scientists took advantage of is this vicinal, remember vicinal as opposed to geminal? Vicinal positioning of hydroxy group and the amino group. So vicinal means they're on adjacent carbons, right? So, uh, so this hydroxy and amino group, they will react with the aldehyde and form a species known as um, uh, hemiaminal. So basically, in other words, it's, uh, you can see it's, uh, there's a nitrogen and there's an oxygen. So it's like hemiaminal, hemiacetal, right? So if, if this nitrogen was an oxygen, we know that this would be an acetal, right? If this oxygen was a nitrogen, this would be aminal. So this is a hybrid, hybrid type structure, one nitrogen, one oxygen. And then what happens is that this nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. It attacks the nearby ester. And by doing so, it will release the fluorescent moiety. Release the fluorescent moiety. Now you can see there's a new amide, this hybrid Acetal hydrolyzes and the quencher departs. The quencher departs. So um, the molecule which is released is the Badipi dye linked through the amide linkage to the um, sphingosine, right? So the, quen the quencher, the Q is gone. And the, quen the Q is gone because uh, we uh, we broke uh, we broke this ester right here this ester here right so this ester is gone all right so that's the idea that's the idea is to separate is to make sphingosine participate in the chemical reaction that will separate the F from Q right so that's the basic idea of how this probe works and you can see here. Now, uh, obviously, every time you do something like this, uh, you have to have a control, control probe. And you can see uh, the actual probe is number one. That's where you have the aldehyde group. It's number one, right? CHO is aldehyde. Number two is hydrogen. So if there's a hydrogen, there will know this hybrid acetal formation be happening, right? If there's no acetal formation, there will be no fluorescent signal. And so in every time we do any kind of experiment, if we see the fluorescent signal with one, probe one, we should not see the fluorescent signal with probe two. And that will confirm that our design works as, as predicted. So you can see here, this is just incubation and you can see, uh, uh, so this is uh, sphingosine. Now, SPA is a minor type of sphingolipid. You can see here the difference between uh, sphingosine and this SPA is the absence of the double bond. <coughs> but there is about 10 to 1 ratio in cells of these two. So we're primarily focusing on the SPH, not on SPA. And you can see there is a significant fluorescent response for the SPH and very small one for the control, right? Virtually, virtually nothing, not even. So these are relative fluorescence units. 
All right. Uh, now this is in cells. So basically cells have been incubated with fingazine. So this is done in um, HeLa cells. So this is, these are cervical cancer cells. Uh, the first actually cancer cell line derived for, for um, biomedical research. And so you can see here, uh, so these are um, cells which, which undergo fluorescence. So you can see the more sphingosine you incubate the cells with, the higher the fluorescence res fluorescent response. So with 40 micromoles of sphingosine, we can, we can see very nice fluorescent response. And with the control two, probe two, there is no fluorescent response, just as we expected. And here it's quantified, you see the higher the bar, the higher the fluorescent relative fluorescence. And this is the concentration of sphingosine in micromolar. And basically this is just uh, visual, right? And this is actually quantif quantification of the visual output. And uh, so this is rel relative fluorescence for uh, the control. C is the control, right? It's compound two. And we can see there is no increase in, flor increase in fluorescence. Now, but this is with added sphingosine. Now this is with endogenous sphingosine, right? So you can see here, uh, same idea. Um, for uh, control, virtually no fluorescence, and there's quite a bit of fluorescence for the probe one, right? And you can see again, uh, the quantification, this bar corresponding to probe one with the aldehyde is much taller than the bar corresponding to probe two without the aldehyde. And the final piece of data here, okay, so um, let's read this. So changes in cellular sphingolipid levels occur in several diseases, okay, and play functional role in disease progression. So we talked about this Neiman pig type C1 is a lysosomal storage disorder caused by a mutation in the NPC1 gene. So this NPC1 gene encodes in a large integral membrane protein. So as, as far as integral membrane proteins, that's the subject of our next chapter. So if you don't know what that means right now, you will know later today or on Friday, integral membrane proteins. So, so exact function of this protein is not known, but when it is mutated, it results in accumulation of several lipids, including sphingosine. And it plays a key role in promoting disease phenotype. And so the patient, uh, patients with this feature a wide range of different neurological and systemic symptoms, which differ from patient to patient, making an accurate diagnosis difficult. But obviously, if the accurate diagnosis cannot be based on the symptoms, you can make the diagnosis based on the level of sphingosine in the patient's cells, right? And so, um, so basically they collected the uh, fibroblasts, which is a type of um, cells, okay, fibroblasts, type of cells, and these are patient-derived fibroblasts. And so um, you can see here, um, so these fibroblasts, we know that they have a mutation in this gene because they arrive from the patients with this disease, disease which is caused by the mutation in this gene. And so this, these cells are diseased, uh, diseased and these cells are healthy. And you can see there is significant, again, increase in fluorescence here and there, uh, just, uh, I don't know the difference between A and B is, but um, the idea here is again, if you quantify this, if you quantify, so these are healthy fibroblasts and these are diseased fibroblasts. Again, the fluorescence, relative fluorescence is much higher in the, in the patient derived fibroblasts. So uh, very, it's now obviously it's uh, still in its academic, um, stage, right? So uh, hopefully uh, the authors patented their probes, but uh, there are still a lot of um, challenges, right? So uh, they just demonstrated the pr proof of principle, 
but lots of challenges before this can become clinically useful, right? This just tells you how difficult it is to, to bring something to the clinic, why there are so, why there are so few drugs or so few um, medicinal agents are being approved by the Food and Drug Administration is because there are so many hurdles that uh, these compounds have to overcome before they can be safely and effectively uh, administered to patients. So for example, here first, one is subject to hydrolysis under biologic conditions, uh, which contributes to substantial fluorescence background. If you look at this structure, what do you think is hydrolyzing? If you look at this, at this probe right here, why do you think it's susceptible to hydrolysis? What are we hydrolyzing? The ester bond. The ester, that's right. Esters are uh, notoriously hydrolytically unstable. In fact, there are few drugs, there are very few drugs in the, on the market that have ester bond functionality, primarily because the esters are so hydrolytically unstable. Unless they're, some, they're, unless they're electronically protected or sterically protected, sterically hindered, in general, esters are not a good functionality to have in a drug. In the cell, that is fine, right? In the cell, it works like a charm. But in the body, we have a lot of uh, metabolic enzymes known as esterases. And their function is to, to, uh, to hydrolyze esters. There are what's, there are what's called nonspecific esterases. All right, and um, second, the reaction rate of our probe is sluggish and requires long incubation times to elicit a sufficient fluorescent response. So in other words, what we have, the reaction here, and this is slow. All right, it's slow. First, you form this, this hybrid type structure, then attack on the ester to transfer the ester to make the amid occurring slow. Right, so um, obviously in a clinic, you don't want to be waiting for days to tell the patient that his levels of sphingosine are high. And when the patient is presented with a life-threatening um, symptoms. All right, so third uh, quenching of BADIPI. Uh, now this is the unit with the ASA bonds, right, the quencher is not complete. So in other words, the quencher works, but it doesn't work very well. And which may be improved by utilizing, utilizing different fluorophore quencher pairs. All right. Um, no, no, that means, so finally one has a low dynamic range resulting in a small difference in fluorescence intensity between normal cells um, and cells with gross changes, gross changes. So basically what they're saying is that even though they're showing these nice figures to us, if you look at that, it, this, looks, this looks much taller than that, right? But if you look at the units, these are relative fluorescence units, right? So we're talking about 1.05, versus 1.2, it's not like it's 10 times, right? So in other words, the, the difference between the intensities in fluorescence are not significant enough to, um, to make this diagnostic test accurate, right? It'll, it will always be subject to um, um, interference by, um, you know, other biological molecules involved or vary from patient to patient. All right, so all these problems have to be solved uh, before this can be turned into a diagnostic tool for lipid storage disorders. All right, if you guys have any questions, hopefully you understood this paper. It's pretty straightforward, that's why I picked this. And look, this is this just came out, right? So it's a highly, um, this is uh, hot from the press, right? This is what scientists are working on these days, which is highly relevant to what we're studying 
in this COVID semester. All right. Questions? <clears throat> All right. Will we see questions on that paper uh, for the um, for the exam? Well, do you think I just uh, spent twenty five minutes for fun? <laughs> fun too, yes. But uh, I want you to learn this stuff. Yeah. So, yes, you will see something from this paper on the test. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. But it's straightforward. You know, it's not really something that should give you a lot of headache before the test. All right. Chapter 11. Chapter 11. We have to hurry up because we're taking much time from chapter 11 and there's quite a bit of material. So biological membranes and transport. So the structure of biological membranes, I told you it's not just lipids, there's lots of stuff in the membranes that we need to talk about. And obviously since biological membranes separate different compartments, different cells, they must, the molecules must be able to cross them. So how this transport is achieved. So, so the functional biological membranes, specifically what they do and why we need them, structure and composition membranes, what's in them, dynamics of the membra membranes, how these uh, components of the membranes, how they move around, how they talk to each other, how they interact with each other, uh, structure and function of membrane proteins, right? So. Uh, Lots of proteins in the membranes. It's one of the great ways also to um, provide home for proteins, right? So if you think about proteins in general, how do proteins find home, right? Where do they um, live? And so many proteins live in cell membranes. And specifically, if you think about if a protein has a hydrophobic region, right? It can very nicely embed itself into cell membrane and just live there. So cell membranes can provide very nice environment for proteins to be localized. Um, okay, and uh, transport across biological membranes. Okay, so as far as the how lipids aggregate, before we before we get on with this with the structure of membranes, it's important <coughs> to talk about three general types of these. Um, lipid aggregates, there's micelles, bilayers, and liposomes. And the structures of these depend on how they aggregate will depend on the type of lipid and its concentration. So micelle is, uh, so we talked about um, soaps, right? We talked about soaps. So these are amphipathic molecules that have a larger polar head, right? Than tail. And so fatty acids, uh, just like in soap, they are perfectly designed for to make my cells. And so you can see the way they work, right? Is that it's like a spherical structure. The head groups are on the outside, interacting with water. All right. And the dirt for the COVID goes inside or I would say uh, um, anything that hydrophobic they can be trapped inside that is try to escape the aqueous environment so uh, now so my cells are composed of a few dozen to a few thousand lipid molecules and aggregation of individual lipids into micelles is concentration dependent, right? 
So, so usual there is um, uh, something we do not study in this class. It's studied mostly in analytical classes. There is what's known as a critical mice cell concentration, CML, sorry, critical mice cell CMC concentration, which is the concentration of the lipid at which the mice cells spontaneously form. Right before that, there will be just um, if the concentration is too small, they will not aggregate. So the aggregation will occur once a certain concentration limit is reached, and then they will all spontaneously come together and form these micelles. Now, membrane bilayer. So now, so the difference between that and the micelles is that there are two leaflets, right? And specifically layers or lipid monolayers. Uh, so, um, Uh, oftentimes these like to form when there is a lipid tail. Uh, there are actually more than one lipid tail. So we talked about structure of glycerol phospholip phospholipids, right, or, or sphingolipids. And, and uh, so these will have two lipid tails, two lipid tails. And also individual units are cylindrical. So when the head group, the size of the head group is roughly the same as that. And that's why probably you need two of these lipid um, tails so that the size of them can actually be similar to the size of the head group. And then uh, the micelle formation is disfavored. Instead, the bilayer formation is more favored because it becomes more cylindric cylindrical. And so the hydrophilic molecules will interact with water right on the outside. And inside, there will be hydrophobic species. Hydrophobic. Okay. And the last one um, that uh, is worth mentioning, we're not gonna spend much time on this, but this uh, very recent research efforts uh, have been applied to these kind of structures. They're known as liposomes. Liposomes, basically what these are, they actually, um, they're vesicles. They're vesicles, so which have the aqueous environment inside, but separated from the external aqueous environment with the lipid bilayer. With the lipid bilayer, so uh, um, many of these can be made synthetically, right? So uh, it's made synthetically, and you can actually put molecules here, hydrophilic molecules. hydrophilic molecules. And so these are actually the interesting thing about them is that liposomes are currently studied as artificial carriers of drugs, for example, right? So if you have a lipophilic drug, it can go inside. inside. So the drug itself can go in, if it's lipophilic, it can, it can go into the lipid bilayer. If it's hydrophilic, it can go inside, right? And so, um, so liposomes are becoming very useful uh, tools for in drug, uh, drug delivery research. <coughs> and uh, so obviously, when, uh, when this comes in close contact with the cell membrane, because they have a lipid bilayer, they can fuse with the cell membrane. So in other words, um, the same lipids can uh, move from the liposome into the cell membrane and release the cargo. Release the cargo, which is the drug, for example, right, into the cell. So these are liposomes. All right, so what are these membranes? Now they're lipid-based structures that are pliable, pliable sheets, composed of a variety of lipids and proteins. So all cells have a cell membrane. 
uh, which separates the cell from its surrounding. Makes sense. Otherwise, <coughs> all the components of the, of the cell will just simply be released into the environment. And also eukaryotic cells have various internal membranes, right, that divide the internal space into compartments. So we know we have lots of organelles inside our cells. And so these organelles also um, have their own um, molecules and particles which uh, belong inside. And so these organelles do not want to release them. So they use biological membranes. So you can see here, so if this is the electron micrograph of a cell, and you can see here, uh, there is full of different types of biological membranes. So for example, these ones, you can see kind of um, these lines, wavy lines. So these are membranes for endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so here, this is the nucleus. The nucleus has its own membrane to keep all the chromosomes inside. Mitochondria, mitochondria have their own uh, membranes and uh, various secretory granules also. So for example, when there is waste accumulating in a, in a cell, right? So the waste, so it's not released into the cell it's accumulated in a secretory granule, for example, the secretory granule will fuse with the cell membrane and release the contents into the extracellular medium. All right, so as far as functions of membranes, all right, so they'll define the boundaries of the cell, allow import and export, right, so the Nutrients, for example, lactose will come in, right? And waste and toxins, uh, for example, toxins like antibiotics, right? So the bacterial cells, for example, um, bacterial cells have membranes that have, that have pumps, that have pumps that pump out antibiotic outside of bacterial cells. You probably have heard of different bacteria known as MDR phenotype. Anybody knows what MDR bacteria are? MDR bacteria. Also associated with things like hospital acquired infection. MRSA? MRSA is one of them. Yeah, so, so MRSA. So, uh, MRSA, which stands for methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, right? MRSA. Um, so there, it's one of the uh, most feared pathogen pathogens, and one of the reasons is because uh, um, if it's methicillin resistant, in general, it's also multi drug, multi drug resistance multi-drug resistant uh, Staphylococcus aureus. And what that means is that it has pumps in its cell membranes, which will pump out all the antibiotics out. So you feed this bacteria with all sorts of different antibiotics, but bacteria don't care. They just grab the antibiotic and pump it out outside of the cell into the extracellular environment. And it doesn't matter what antibiotic that is. That's why it's called multi-drug, right? And so oftentimes you will treat uh, MRSA with different antibiotics, sometimes 10, 15 different kinds, and nothing will work, right? So um, it's, a, it's a topic of its, of its own, a huge area of research. Obviously, um, we don't want to see patients in the past when patients had a, just to take, um, uh, one or two antibiotics and the Staphylococcus aureus infection um, goes away. Now there, are these, now there are these resistant strains which do not simply go away. And uh, these patients oftentimes simply die after staying in the hospital. All right, so um, then uh, 
membranes retain metabolites and ions within the cell, right? So uh, many of these metabolites and ions will be, will have charges, will have charges or be polar. So they will not be able to cross cell membrane, right? Uh, they will sense external signals, right? So the membranes have to be able to know, have to have some kind of um, um, molecules on the outside. They can sense what's going on in the outside world and transmit that information into the cell. Now compart compartmentalization within the cell. So we just talked about, right? Specifically, um, not only we want to separate the nucleus from mitochondria, but in general, if you have energy producing reactions, you want to separate these from energy consuming ones. Otherwise they will react with each other. It's like separating acids and bases. If you don't separate an acid from a base, what will happen? Can you keep both acid and base in the same compartment? No. What will happen? They'll react with each other. React with each other to give us salt and water, right? From general chemistry. So um, same thing with the energy producing reactions and the energy consuming ones. You want to split these and use them and control them differently. Uh, also proteolytic enzymes away from important cellular proteins, right? So we have lots of proteolytic enzymes and they're important. Otherwise you will not be able to recycle and degrade um, proteins which are present in large excess or no longer necessary for the cell. So you need these proteolytic enzymes, but on the other hand, you don't want them to start chopping up everything inside the cell, right? In fact, uh, the release of proteolytic enzymes is one of the characteristic of apoptosis uh, when the um, when the cell basically uh, cell constituents are starting to be um, degraded by the proteolytic enzymes. So, but that's controlled. That's controlled. Produce and transmit nerve signals. So that we talked about neurons a little bit. Store energy as proton gradient. So that's biochem two. You will study that in biochem two specifically how the proton gradient is generated and how the energy is generated from that and how the ATP is synthesized from the energy separation in mitochondria. Okay, common features of membranes. Common features of membranes. So sheet-like structures, 30 to 100 angstroms thick, Two leaflets, right? Sometimes they're called bi it's called bilayers. Uh, now there's uh, there's there are bacteria like archaea bacteria, uh, which um, have monolayer. Actually, we're going to look at some at the structure of one of these, but this is very rare. It's outdated. Uh, form spontaneously, stabilized by non-covalent forces. Uh, we know that protein molecules can span the lipid bilayer. We talked about that. And uh, something we have not talked yet about is that the lipids are often asymmetric. What that means is that some lipids are found more commonly inside and some lipids are found more commonly outside, right? Very important. And some lipids can undergo uh, fl flipping. They can go from inside into outside, and that's actually an important process in signal transduction. And we'll briefly mention that as well. Again, another important characteristic of apoptosis. Carbohydrate moieties are attached to the outer leaflet. Okay, and as I mentioned to you, carbohydrates, when you have carbohydrates on the surface of the cell, that's an important recognition um, motif so that the foreign cells can recognize what the cell is all about by looking at its, at its carbohydrates on the surface. All right, and so these are fluid structures. 
there are two-dimensional solutions of oriented lipids, right? So things can swim in them. Uh, Dr. Uh, yeah. I had a quick question. The carbohydrate one, is that like LPS? Or is that not the same thing about talking about them being attached at the outer leaflet? What's OPS? Uh, the lipopolysaccharides, the outer layer of bacteria. Uh, oh, okay, 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 okay. Um, uh, so in bacteria, so, so here primarily with, uh, what I had in mind is uh, eukaryotic cells here. But in bacteria, you, you're right. So different uh, gram-negative bacteria, right, um, will have an outer layer, lipopolysaccharide, whose structure varies from one, one strain to another. And so these bacteria can be recognized by the, for example, by the immune system, right, based on their structure of the lipopolysaccharide. Yes, so the answer is yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, so fluid mosaic model of membranes proposed in 72. There's nothing really difficult about it. Basically, it's a viscous two-dimensional solvent into which proteins are inserted and integrated more or less deeply. Now, proteins can be embedded or associated with the membrane. Now, integral proteins are firmly associated with the membrane, often spanning the bilayer. Right, so you have bilayer like this, bilayer, bilayer, and here is the, comes the protein, usually it's alpha helix inside, like that. So this will be an integral integral protein okay so it will be obviously firmly associated with the cell membrane so this alpha helix which is inside you may imagine that it's actually um, uh, composed it, it contains primarily hydrophobic amino acids right which will interact with the fatty acid tails inside the cell membrane. All right, and peripheral proteins. So these proteins which are somehow associated with the, so let's say if there is a, if there is a head group here, right? So a peripheral protein can be associated with the cell membrane like so. We will have actually better pictures of this. So right now I'm just introducing the idea for you. But we'll have much better pictures of these. So that's peripheral. Okay, and so the weakly associate can be removed more easily. Some of them are non-covalently attached, and some of them are actually linked to membrane lipids. So the protein itself can have a lipid tail that can integrate itself into the lipid bilayer, but non-covalently. So uh, to end, let's look at this uh, uh, slide. So basically this will be the lipid bilayer. Here is the outside. Here we have a glycolipid, right? So um, some kind of lipid would be, now remember, again, the carbohydrates will be in the, on the outside, right? So it's a glycolipid. Now this is oligosaccharide chains of glycoprotein. So if this is uh, a protein, now this will be an integral protein, right? I told you about this alpha helix going inside. And this is on the outside, this is on the inside. And there may be some kind of oligosaccharide a chain on the glycoprotein. So these are phospholipid polar heads. 
now sterols embedded in cell membranes. Um, now this is peripheral protein, peripheral protein, which is weakly associated with the head groups here, right? You can see you can break it off easily. Uh, if it's just uh, a ionic interaction, you can break this off, for example, by changing the pH, right? So peripheral proteins are only loosely associated. And you can see there are different colors. So for example, um, this will be um, uh, glycerophospholipid, glycerophospholipid and oh, sorry, glycerophospholipid, and this could be sphingolipid, right? Just different kinds of lipids. Now, this one is covalently linked, linked to a lipid. You can see here, so it's a peripheral protein, but it has a tail. And this tail inserts into the lipid bilayer and localizes the protein to this uh, cell membrane. And we'll talk about this uh, glycosyl phosphatidylinositol, GPI anchor proteins a little later. These are much more complex constructs, but play a huge role in association of proteins to the cell membrane. So we'll stop here for today. I'll open the homework, even though you still have, um, you're still working on homework that is due on Saturday, right? But if you finish that early, you know that there's another one waiting for you. But obviously we'll make, I'll come up with that, with a deadline of, of for next week sometime. All right, any questions? Any questions about today? No, it's all good. All right, and I'll see you guys on Friday. Bye. Thanks.